Hey, y'all. For two? All right. Here, y'all follow me. My name is Clara Ritker, and I'm an amateur cook, professional eater, and documentary filmmaker. For 10 days, I took a train across the country to tell the stories of revitalizing communities through the lens of food. This is The Great American Cooking Story. You get the full you just, effect of the storm. Right? You just, uh, yeah, I know. Is it going to split? Oh, I guess it's about to, it's coming now. It took a while for people to get used to the idea of coming to this neighborhood. Ferret Street suffered badly from people moving to the suburbs and inner city urban decay until Katrina. And after Katrina, it just seemed like there are little neighborhoods like this in New Orleans people started paying more attention to. Five or six years ago, there just seemed to be a groundswell of interest in this neighborhood, and we were lucky to, to get in on it. Chip is originally from Memphis, Tennessee, but came to New Orleans after Katrina. Featuring Mississippi Delta and traditional Louisiana cuisine, his menu is a reflection of the two places he's called home. More than 500 new restaurants have opened in New Orleans after Katrina, and the economic activity is driving change in the city. I sought out old school Southern cooking, and the story of how one neighborhood has in many ways benefited from the boom. When we bought this building five years ago, the most of the property on the street was either empty or occupied but blighted. There was not much going on on the street at all. I mean, at nighttime or on the weekends, it was a, it was a ghost land. A couple of boutiques, a bagel shop, you know, places have opened along in this little eight or ten block strip that, um, that weren't here five years ago, and, and it's happened pretty quickly. I was surprised. I, I, was, I thought it was going to happen, but I'm surprised it happened as quick as it did. And then the surrounding residential neighborhood has, has followed suit. People are buying up houses and renovating houses, and the whole neighborhood is kind of coming up uh, residentially as well. Pretty cool. Blueberries and peaches, peaches will be in very soon. Our peach guy just actually told us the other day that next week he'll be able to start, he'll be able to bring us good peaches. And then we'll do that peach and blueberry pie for a while. Then when the blueberries go away, then it'll just be peach only. And then watermelon and crab meat will be coming back soon. It's great to do use the seasonal produce. And Louisiana is a very good place to source that kind of stuff. All of our fish comes from the Gulf. And as much as we can, we buy our produce from the local farmer's market. We get donuts from Troy down at the Fred Street Donut Shop every day for a, an item on our dessert menu. There is a, uh, a sense of pride in the, in the neighborhood. You know, when you're out of something, you can always borrow something on the street. And we refer people to other restaurants. People are interested in the other's success, I think. A few months before I came to Ferret Street, a restaurant was held up at gunpoint. But that hasn't stopped the success of the neighborhood restaurant scene. Despite the fact that more than 50% of restaurants fail after three years, the places that have opened on Ferret Street in the 10 years after Katrina have become neighborhood fixtures. This is where, where the donuts are made. A lot of donut shops, they have this um, mechanical cutter. So they just run it through and it just cuts. But we're cutting them one at a time. Everything is still done the old fashioned way. Myra was living in New Orleans before Katrina. 
but was working in the school system. She came back after the storm, and together with Troy Rodies, opened Ferret Street Po' Boys and Donuts. I didn't stay. I, um, I did evacuate to Texas. Uh, but when I came back home, I came back pretty early in December, I believe it was December of 05, tried to start rebuilding, and it was, it was difficult. There wasn't any electricity in the city. There was a curfew, and the worst part about it was that we didn't have any medical care, any health care. We didn't have a pharmacy. It was an experience. I can't say I hated it either because it made you appreciate the things that you do have. Because I can remember, um, if you didn't get food before 5 o'clock, you were going to starve. Because what, what, what was here would shut down about 5 o'clock. She just cut the smoked sausage up. She's making jambalaya. And we do that from scratch. And I think, I don't know if you, did you put the shrimp yet? No, that comes in last. You don't want to put that too early because it'll cook away especially for native New Orleanians. Food actually played a big role in people coming back to this city because some of the foods that we have here, you couldn't get them other places. So we got homesick off of not having the food. And it brought new people back here because you had so many people who came from other places to work and to help rebuild the city who actually started eating and trying, trying the food and they liked it. I just believe food was, um, was very influential after Katrina uh, for the natives and new people that came along. There were people trying to cook traditional New Orleans foods, but they did not taste like the food that we grew up eating. So we thought that we could do it better. It went from po' boys and donuts to hot plate lunches, red beans and rice, gumbo, and just everything New Orleans that people here love to eat on a regular basis. What kind of po' boys was it? Oh, uh, roast beef. Six, uh, six inch? No, uh, ten inch. Okay, y'all got a ten inch roast beef? I want people to feel like they experience real New Orleans, true New Orleans culture when they eat the food here. Um, because the food can tell a lot about a culture and a people. So I want them to feel like they came down here and actually went to someone's house and ate and got that taste, that real authentic New Orleans Creole taste. We're doing this from scratch. Um, we don't take any shortcuts. We're cutting up onions, bell peppers, hand chopping, garlic, and we're cooking with that. We're not using the powdered stuff. So I think that's what makes the food so unique here. And when people come here and they eat the food, they tell us all the time it tastes like it was cooked at home. And I say that's because we cook like we cook at home. I think the biggest role that I have, and, and, and the one that I'm proud of, is that even though I'm a, this is a minority-owned restaurant, I attract di a, a, a diverse group of people. I have people from every race, nationality that come here for this food. And even though everybody could be different and, and, and may, may have differences, we all love the same food. The budget breakfast came from me wanting to be able to serve every income level um, food here. So I came up with the budget breakfast for the price that we have it where even a, pers a person can actually literally go out and scrap up some cash and come here and buy a whole meal, a whole breakfast with grits, eggs, bacon, toast, or biscuit for under $5. You have people who come in here, because of the way we're set up, we're not that big, who order food and sit at the table with a stranger that they don't even know and have a conversation over lunch with a stranger. So they could be talking to the guy that lives down the street. And this could be a, a, an affluent person that comes from uh, one of the more affluent neighborhood, and he's sitting right here with just your average guy who lives up the street having lunch and talking. I think that the new people are coming in, they're looking at how the old people do things. They're looking at the culture, the way of life, 
and they are embracing it. And the old people are welcoming some of the new things that are coming, like the shops and uh, the different restaurants and the decrease in crime, of course. And with transition, there's always gonna be challenge, but one of the challenge is um, with gentrification. Of course, some people feel like they're being forced out. And, you know, it d did cause taxes to go up on some people's homes. So it affects your native people who have been here. Let me tell you, I, I love being here, but I will say my, I'm, I'm leasing this spot and the landlord constantly tells me he, he don't know if he wants to renew my lease. That is the little issue I have with gentrification because he's from up north, someone from up north brought the building, and he does not value what's here. I would, I would shut down because he's thinking that he might want to put something different, change the concept here and put something different. But I've had customers to come here and ask me about that and they were heartbroken. And I, I reassured them that I was gonna be here, of course, but I really don't know. It's, it's not up to me. But I think that if that were to happen, uh, we would have a lot of people disappointed because we are becoming an institution up here, this restaurant. Because we're one of the only ones that is doing what we do in New Orleans naturally. And, and that's with the food. We're holding on to our tradition here. Myra and many others who came back to New Orleans after Katrina came back to preserve the history and the food of the place they called home. What was once a fight to save their home is now a fight for the right to remain in it. If Ferret Street is going to be a picture of revitalization done well, that picture isn't complete without Myra and her po-boys.